Ori permission language is a real game changer. And it's with uh, every movie and great story. The story itself is important, but even more fun is to hear making of the movie and making of the story story. It's my true pleasure to introduce Patrick New and uh, Henning Pearl to tell that story to you. Thank you. Go uh, take it away. Okay, thanks. Um, so, yeah, today we want to, um, as Harry said, um, tell you how we made the Ori permission language a real thing. And first of all, of course, we have to give some context and explain what is the Ori permission language, why did we create it in the first place. Um, so, yeah, basically, um, the Ori permission language is a feature of Keto. And Keto is an open source product of Ori that solves um, authorization. So, yeah, Henning gives you now a bit of context on how that fits into the overall picture. Yes. Um, so, I think the journey we see a lot from um, users of Keto is, uh, or um, of uh, the Ori permission uh, system, is that um, you start with just um, solving permissions in your service directly. So you write some code, like, uh, okay, I have a user, and that user can read um, these documents, and this other user can write those documents, and then um, you basically have a little bit of permission logic in your service, right? Nothing bad. Uh, but at some point, you scale up. You, you get funding, or you get more users, or whatever. And then um, you have some permission checks that you want to do in the front end, like do I want to display this button to delete um, the document or not? Um, and then you have multiple microservices, one for the documents, one for the groups, um, and you have to basically repeat that bit of sprinkling of uh, permission logic in each um, service, and each service is maybe written in a different language, uh, at least on the front end, it's another language, it's uh, in the back end. Some permission checks you want to do in your gateway, and you can already tell that this will become very, very complex. Uh, and the solution uh, to that problem is actually a paper published by um, Google a couple of years ago uh, called Zanzibar, uh, which um, introduces a new uh, methodology of a central permission system. And, um, Ori Keto and um, the permission service in uh, the Ori network is an implementation of uh, Google's Zanzibar. So you have one single source of truth, and each service can reach out um, to the permission service and ask concrete questions, like can this user, this subject, do anything, a verb, like edit, delete, um, on this object? Okay, so um, now the question is, how does that look uh, with a concrete example? Um, so what Keto has internally is uh, so-called relationships. So what it stores, it's kind of the fact. So basically it stores, this user is the owner of this document. Um, so like in this example, um, the overall question is, is the user Bob allowed to edit the document secrets? Um, and then we have the relationship stored in the database as source of truth, that's like a fact that we have about the world, and then we know Bob is an owner of the document secrets. But what we need is a rule that defines that any owner of a document can edit that document. And this um, rule uh, language is what we're talking about now. Um, so what Keto supported until like two months ago was basically only checking relationships that are stored in the database. And we added this rule language, this um, yeah, Ori permission language on top. And this will allow you to define a global rule and then derive actual permissions from the relations. Um, yeah, so that's what the Ori permission language is used for. Um, and yeah, then now the making of, uh, as Harry said, uh, how did we arrive there? Um, so first we started with uh, requirements and hypotheses. Um, then uh, something that I actually found very valuable um, even in, in joining Ori was to talk to users. We have a great uh, community uh, of uh, users of Keto and of uh, all the 
uh, other services as well. So we reached out to them. We did uh, one-hour interviews with them. Um, we learned a bunch about that, um, about the mental model and the domain-specific uh, uh, problems. Um, then we arrived at the final design, which we want to show you. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about implementation. And uh, finally, we want to uh, celebrate the launch of the ORI permission languages uh, in the ORI network. So yeah, you are here. Um, and um, of course, big shout out to um, everyone that took part in the user interviews. So if you take away one thing from this talk, uh, then uh, that you should do more user interviews and ask your users from time to time uh, because it's really valuable feedback that you, that you gain. Yeah, and of course also having this whole open source community is just super valuable and thanks again to everyone who participated, who is here in person, who's watching. So yeah, that's really valuable for us. Okay, so um, our requirements and hypotheses. We started off and we said, okay, we want to build a system that's secure and that's secure by default. So what we want to have is something that people can use without taking extra courses, uh, taking a re refreshment course every half a year, uh, where you don't need a dedicated team just working on permissions, but it should be straightforward. Everyone should be able to understand what it does, at least in the basics. Um, so it had to be self-explanatory, familiar, um, users should be able, or developers should be able to uh, modify um, permissions with high confidence that they're doing what they want to do, actually. There should be good editor support, because that's, for the developer experience, super important. Um, and then it should be also possible to test it and automate stuff, so you want to have linters, tester, test frameworks to verify that when you're changing stuff, it does what it's supposed to do. Um, and then we also uh, defined from the beginning, we don't want to go with something that's Turing complete, so um, it should be easier on our side to parse, process, and yeah, work with it without too many um, security implications on that. Right, um, from that uh, requirement, uh, we moved on to the user interviews. Um, so we started with, uh, with a, a framework and a guideline for the interviews. Um, those were about one hour guided interviews with community members, which we recruited from uh, our community Slack. And um, the questions were around modeling um, the permission schema in different languages. So we came up with some um, different languages that all kind of went into different uh, dimensions um, uh, that you could design the language around. And then uh, we had a common scenario, which is kind of like um, Dropbox or Google, some kind of file management system, which is kind of abstract enough and still familiar enough. Um, so yeah, we, um, we want to thank again everybody that took part in those interviews. Okay, so uh, our first case was the original Sensibar implementation, like this is basically copy-pasted from the paper. Um, I'm pretty sure you will agree with all the interviews we talked to, uh, that it's basically verbose, confusing, and unable to parse as a human. Um, that's partially because what they did in the paper was to just expose, or like an original Zanzibar, to expose the internal data structure. And they just didn't have time and uh, enough pain to develop a specific language to express this. So all they did was expose the abstract syntax tree in a JSON or YAML-like syntax. And yeah, it's super confusing and unable, like unusable in a way. And definitely not what we wanted to achieve. Yeah, but it, it served as a good um, ground truth um, for the second language, uh, which is uh, very concise. Um, so it's basically inspired by what uh, Auth0 did with OpenFGA. Um, and uh, I don't want to walk you through everything, uh, but the, the feedback from the interviews was that this, uh, what's confusing is this S self, like why do I have to put S self everywhere? Um, it kind of, uh, you kind of know that if you know the legacy of 
uh, bad coming from Zanzibar because that's this kind of this um, um, artifact in the um, Zanzibar RST that they modeled as, as self. Um, there's also no type safety, again, same as in the Zanzibar RST. Um, and it's really concise, but concise from our feedback was not always better. So it was not always better to have this very compact definition if like every line or every character um, could trip you up in your uh, permission model. Yeah, so our next approach then uh, was to basically define some types and define the relations uh, of the types um, with, again, the kind of receiver type. So um, it's a typed way. It's more, it's easier for editor to give you code completion and support because it knows which type you want to have or you can use at that point. And then we, after you defined all the types, you have these like for all blocks that's very math uh, based and math inspired. So basically you define, if you see the stuff on that side, you also basically infer the stuff on the right side. So that's um, yeah, kind of a logic and functional approach to uh, expressing those rules. And people really like the typed approach and the way they could then yeah, better reason about how stuff relates to each other. And some really loved and some really hated the logic part of it, so it was really a mixed bag and uh, not the ideal, ideal thing to go uh, with. Yes, and then um, for the final um, proposition, um, we went with something that was both typed as well as declarative, so it's kind of like a combination of um, two and three. And um, for anyone that knows that space, it's in, uh, inspired by Auth Z and their schema language. Um, so there, um, we had the benefit that types are really nice. So types help uh, the users understand um, what what um, goes on and also define uh, new rules. Um, but there was still some kind of confusion over uh, the syntax. For example, if you want to state that um, you can view something, if you can view the parent, then it would be kind of this parent arrow viewer statement um, that implies some kind of transitive travel through the permission graph, if you want. Um, that was kind of unfamiliar. Okay, so um, our key takeaways were that Basically, everyone agreed uh, types are helpful, and we also knew from a technical perspective it makes code completion f possible in the first place to have typing and type infer in, like yeah types in the first place. Um, a lot of people struggled with the transitivity of the rules, um, not even by the language design, but just by the concept in the first place. So um, yeah, basically we had to find a way to um, make this concept uh, understandable for everyone and the language can really help there. Um, none of those languages uh, felt familiar. It was in a way similar to other stuff but still not the same and still had some other concepts because it's not really a programming language in the first place because you're uh, talking about abstract things. You're not assigning variables or transforming specific data but you're on, only providing program without any input in a way. Um, and then, yeah, it was always for everyone hard to reason about the implications, like what is actually written here. So none of the languages really was uh, easy to read from top to bottom and then uh, understandable by a human without any further documentation or explanation. So we went back to the drawing board and started to play with TypeScript because TypeScript is a great ecosystem, comes with a lot of tools and uh, linters and unit testing frameworks and whatever. It is self-explanatory and familiar because most of the people used at least JavaScript at some point if they programmed because websites are very common. Uh, the tooling in general is pretty common. so. Um, it's at least very easy uh, for people to get started. 
Um, it's also yeah easy to modify with confidence because if you know TypeScript, you know what you wrote, so uh, you don't have to think about the syntax and look up the definition again. Uh, good editor support, of course, out of the box because most editors know TypeScript by now. And then, yeah, as I said, there is already unit testing and linters available uh, that we could use and leverage to continue. Yes, so um, let's finally look at an example of the OR permission language. So I don't want to walk you through everything, um, but just as a mindset, it's kind of like um, you um, define your namespaces or your Keto namespaces as classes, and then you have um, this graph database which connects this class with other classes, so you have always one-to-n relationships, and then the permissions are basically as you would write them in JavaScript using those attributes as arrays. So I can basically say uh, these um, in, in, the, in the middle of the uh, code, um, the, I have, I have uh, viewers, and that's an array, and does this viewer include my subject that I'm currently looking at? And this is kind of how you would program TypeScript. So it gives you an instant confidence that this code is really correct and that's uh, um, translating to the correct thing. Um, also what we did is we introduced the context object, which currently just has the subject, but what we are looking for is to extend that with context sensitive information, for example, this, um, user comes from a trusted device, for example, and then you can do special handling based on the trust level of the device. So maybe some, uh, maybe some resources aren't readable or writable if you're not on a trusted device, or an IP range, or a time zone, or a timestamp, or whatever. Um, so um, as in the other languages, uh, of course, with TypeScript, we have a strong type support. Um, and with that, we have a really great editor support. So if you right now edit um, this or permission language in VS Code, you get automatic type completion. If you edit that in uh, the Ori console, uh, we have a great editor support that uh, uses the same editor as uh, in VS Code. And they also have great uh, auto-completion, great feedback, um, and we could build that in a matter of hours really, literally, so it's, it's that nice of a technology. Okay, so uh, some implementation details. Um, we said in the beginning we don't want a Turing complete language and then we go with TypeScript, which is Turing complete, obviously. Um, so what we um, basically do is we don't just run the code, but we um, interpret it in a way um, and have a custom parser that just um, accepts a subset of TypeScript, so you can't do all kinds of fancy stuff and use whatever uh, is available in TypeScript. It just supports a subset, but it's still everything that it supports is valid TypeScript. Um, so we can later add more features as needed, but for now it yeah, works with the subset and the, the limited uh, features. And we don't execute the code, but we parse it, and then we build the abstract syntax tree. So that's what you saw in the very beginning. Uh, what's in the Zanzibar paper, this super deeply nested tree of uh, operations. That's what we built from the TypeScript code. And um, yeah, that's basically how we implemented all of this. And uh, for writing the custom parser, um, that was a lot of work on Henning's side as well, so if you ever need to write a custom parser, you can just ask him, and it's very easy, he said. <laughs> we did write fuzzles for that. <laughs> um, so yeah, now, now, uh, now to the fun part. Uh, after all the hard work, uh, we are very happy uh, to have launched um, the Ori permission language uh, in the Ori network. Um, so you can use it directly in Ori Keto, um, and you can also use it in the Ori network either through the uh, command line interface 
But actually, the, the best way to get started right now is just load up the console, uh, which is uh, free for developers. Uh, and there you have an integrated editor. You can hack away at the ORI permission language, and then you can just query the system and try out um, uh, what answers you get back. So um, yeah, we are really start, um, excited. It was an, it was an exciting journey um, to build this. It was well needed, and uh, we were very happy to not just copy uh, the competitors out there, because Orikita was kind of the first open source implementation of uh, Zanzibar, uh, but we were actually not the first one to come up with the permission language. There, were, there was prior work, so to say, which also helped us uh, in the interviews, but uh, I'm very happy um, to have landed on something different and something better in my kind of highly biased uh, opinion. Uh, but yet, I think that it's something that uh, really helps uh, you write the language um, if it's a language that's uh, widely available and has good tooling support, um, good unit testing capabilities. So we're really excited what you as the Ori community and the users of Ori Keto and the permissioning system are building with the Ori permission language. Um, really always looking for use cases and edge cases. Um, and yeah, please share uh, your experience with us and with the rest of the community, like either directly or through a blog post, uh, through a qu uh, quick Twitter post, whatever. Uh, suits your mind to just stay in contact and give us feedback. Okay, and then uh, one last thing, what's coming next? So we talked about testing and linting, all of that is yeah, not uh, available out of the box right now. You could build something yourself, but it will probably take uh, more testing code than actual code you tested. Uh, so we want to change that and provide a framework that works for um, that sets up everything for you, and then you can just write some examples, see if uh, you get the expected result. Uh, we want to build a playground where you can just hack away, send a link to uh, your colleagues, and uh, see what you show them what you built, and then they can yeah hack away from there. Uh, we want to build some visualization uh, so you can better understand what you actually wrote and maybe it's then also easier to reason about it with non-technical people because uh, TypeScript is nice and probably easy for most of developers to read but maybe not for the managers. And then we want to also extend uh, yeah, the editor support even more by providing language servers and um, what the last point I added uh, this morning during the talk of in music because uh, they mentioned the thing that we actually do, do have on the roadmap but didn't have on that slide yet, which is migrations. So we also um, thought about migrations, so that's why also we use functions in a way. So it will later hopefully be possible to also define a way to migrate stuff and relations with the ORI permission language. Um, so yeah, that's definitely something that's on our roadmap and that we will be putting effort into. And as always, with all our open source contributions are welcome. Please read our code and uh, give feedback if you have any, even if it's good feedback. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, thank you for listening and we're open for questions now. Is there any questions? Um, yeah, uh, so um, how long did it take you uh, to write from like the design of the language to the custom parser? And would you do it again? <laughs> um, yeah, I think I can answer that. So I think the just the parsing were just, I don't know, a week or one and a half. It was not that much time. So the majority of the, like if you look at the time frame, what we spend a lot of time on were the user interviews, uh, because we really wanted to nail the definition of the language. Um, so yeah, that, that took a long time. The parsing was actually not that much work, uh, but then actually using the parsed tree uh, in the 
um, checks. So when you then ask uh, Keto for something uh, and you get a response back, that was um, more work because it should be concurrent but deterministic at the same time uh, and it should be fast, correct, uh, and all these kind of opposing requirements. I would say. Yeah, and I guess uh, would we do it again? Um, and I'd say probably yes, because uh, so far we had great experience with it and uh, also got good feedback until now. And I think it's really the best way to go forward. And if we took some other route, we would have to write our own parser anyways as well. So um, yeah, using this made it a bit easier uh, to then just use the same code and put it into like an actual node uh, testing framework uh, because then you don't have to translate it somehow or write your own runtime or whatever. Hello, thank you for uh, the presentation. I was just wondering, is the Python example equivalent to the TypeScript, TypeScript example, in particular uh, the subject group, subject group concept. Um, I mean, the, I wouldn't say it's like really accurate line by line because I'm not sure that like you uh, prepared the code samples for. So the in, in general, the, it's it's equivalent, yeah. So the, from the Python code, what you're missing is all the type definitions, and you just take them out, and then the permission logic is translatable. But it's basically only the second half of um, of what you want to say, or what we found mo most users in the interviews wanted to say. But yeah, it's somewhat equivalent. Yeah, and the examples are basically also the same content. I'm just not sure if like, it's really in every detail the same, but it's about the same. So from like code size and like number of lines, it's uh, comparable. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Pearl. Thank you, Patrick. As always, success has many fathers, and the failure would be orphan. And uh, well, thank you for sharing, proud fathers, the origin story of the ORI permission language.